Good evening and welcome to another NTX Freediving live stream. Tonight is going to be an in-depth look at the physics and physiology of mouthfeel. Now, a lot of people have asked me over the years about mouthfeel and especially on the live streams it comes up as a repeated question. I've even touched on it a couple of times in the sessions. So I thought it was about time we had a dedicated video specifically on the physics and physiology of mouthfeel. So this isn't an opinion, this is what happens to the body when we go freediving. How individuals choose to use this information is entirely up to them and at their own risk. If you don't know what mouthfeel is, or you're not sure whether you use it or if you've been taught it, then I will be describing what it is and how to use it in great detail. So carry on watching. Now, this information I published first in 2010 uh, in a book called Deep Freediving. And I kind of thought the dangers would be taught as soon as people understood the physiology of it, people would um, understand the dangers and therefore teach the dangers. But over the past 10 years, it hasn't come to pass like that. And people have been teaching the technique to uh, you know, new and new, newer and newer freedivers. And in fact, there's been a miscommunication and people have started teaching um, mouthfeel as a safety technique, as a way of diving deeper safely to avoid uh, lung damage. And this is all, you know, miscommunication is not the way it works. And people are getting injured from using it. And in fact, in extreme cases, people are dying. So I thought it was about time that we went through and uh, concisely put down what mouthfeel is and how it affects the body. So the first off, I want to look at the physics. When you put a gas under pressure, it compresses, the volume changes. When you put liquid under pressure, it doesn't change volume it's it doesn't compress it's called Boyle's law it's basic free diving or scuba diving uh, knowledge and that's the only physics you need to know to understand the concepts we're going to be talking about tonight um, so let's have a look at the physiology when you're diving holding your breath your lungs are full of air and we've already mentioned Boyle's law. So as you dive down, the lungs are full of a gas, air, and they will compress and they will get smaller. When you come back up, they expand back to the original size. This also happens in the middle ear. Inside the middle ear, there's an air pocket, which when you descend down, you increase the pressure and it compresses down. And you can feel the eardrums are bending inwards and you can feel discomfort or pain so you equalize the ears you put air from your lungs into the middle ears to relieve that pressure that strain on the eardrums and the, and the pain this is called equalization and that's it that's all we need to know let's have a look in a little bit more detail about what happens so here's a scan of uh, the thorax, a chest uh, of someone. It's a slice through the body effectively. Here we have the lungs. And here we have the uh, rib cage. So at the front, that, li that line at the top is the, the thorax, uh, the, the breastplate and the ribs. And uh, at the side you can see the ribs. Here we have the heart, which is in between the two lungs. And here we have the spine. So at the surface, you take a full lung full of air and the lungs are full of air. And then we dive down and the pressure increases and the lungs will compress. And as the lungs compress, they pull the ribs downwards. They're joined and as the uh, lungs get smaller, they pull 
the rib cage in. So you can see here, this is what happens. Everything compresses. Now you can see this on videos. Um, here's a still I've just put up here from a video I put up a few years ago. And this is a camera pointing down um, at me on the sled. So I'm going to spin the video, spin the uh, photo around so you can see how it relates to uh, the scan shot. So it's exactly the same shot looking down and you can see that kind of uh, question mark bit of metal kind of lining up with my chest. This is a still taken from when I was at the surface, maybe three meters underwater. And here's a still taken from 40, 50 meters. And you can see how my chest has been compressed in. So from the surface, as the pressure increases, the chest moves away. And you can see this in many videos, many deep diving videos, where the diver's wetsuit is tight at the surface, and then when they go deep, the chest compressed, and you can see the, the wetsuit kind of moving around. You can see this on many, many videos. So let's go back to the lungs, uh, the scan of the lungs. <clears throat> As we dive down, uh, the lungs compress and pull the ribs in. That's what we, we expect to happen. But if there's not the flexibility in the chest, in the rib cage, if, that f if there's not the flexibility to move inwards like this, the lungs will still compress. Nothing can stop them, but they will pull away from the ribs like this so the ribs will stay where they are the lungs will compress and pull away and this is a tear or in free diving they call it a lung squeeze now if it's a small tear you there's no way of knowing it's happened there's no pain receptors in the lungs so you can't feel that you've had a, a lung squeeze or a lung tear uh, the only way you can see it is uh, on a scan, there'll be a lesion and later on it'll heal up and be a scar. So people say, oh, I've been doing this for years, I've been doing that, I've been using mouthfeel, I've never had a, a lung squeeze. And the question is, well, how do you know you've not had a lung squeeze? You can't see it, you can't feel it unless you've had a lung scan. But moving forwards if you keep going down if you've had a, a, had this this kind of uh, tear the, the ribs are not flexible enough to follow the lungs as they compress and you continue to go down you'll get a large tear now this will uh, impact the lungs you'll get fluid on the lungs whether it's blood or a secondary fluid Free divers come up and they can cough up blood out of the lungs, and this is because it's a large tear uh, or a lung squeeze. Equally well, the lungs don't work very well, so the person will feel fatigued. Uh, there'll be a difficulty to breathe, and in in extreme cases, you know, death death can can occur. So, <clears throat> if you dive down and you can take air out of the lungs and, and, and the lungs can, uh, you know, the rib cage can move, then all good. But if you get to a point where you can't take air out of the lungs to equalize the ears, but whether you use um, unpacking or reverse packing or uh, pulling up, doesn't matter, there's, there's various techniques to pull air out of the lungs to equalize the ears. If you get to a point where you can't take the air out of the, out of the lungs, that means the rib cage is locked and, and is not flexible enough to bend anymore. Then that's the, di that's the depth you stop at. Mouthfill circumnavigates this. Mouthfill is the process of taking air out of the lungs at a shallow depth and storing it in the mouth as you go deeper and use the air in the mouth to equalize the ears. So if you've had to use mouthfill 
to go to a depth that you couldn't take air directly out of your lungs and equalize with, you have damaged your lungs. Let's say that again. If you've had to use mouthfill to go deeper than somewhere, a depth that you can take air out of your lungs and equalize with directly, you have damaged your lungs. And if it's a small tear, there's no way of telling. If it's a large tear, you're in serious, serious trouble. And it's um, unnerving how many people report that they've ha been having these, uh, these injuries. Of course, relaxation comes into this as well. So if there's tension, the chest can't move. Um, so you need to be relaxed. And I don't mean just relaxed. I mean honestly relaxed, truly relaxed. And this comes from awareness and honesty. And that's two of the, the five concepts that I believe every freediver should understand and master. And I've covered it in a video actually called Five Concepts that you need to know uh, a few weeks ago, a live stream. But ultimately, it's the flexibility that denotes whether you're doing damage or not. So I personally believe if you unpack or you know, reverse pack or pull up air out of the lungs and equalize at every depth, you're checking the flexibility of your chest. And if you can use the air out of the lungs directly to equalize with, then you know you've got the flexibility at that depth. As soon as you can't take air out of the lungs to equalize with, you haven't got the flexibility and that's the point to stop. And as I say, I believe you haven't done any damage to, to the lungs using that technique, so you can carry on training. So that session doesn't have to end. Yes, I would suggest you don't go down to that depth again. You've been to your, your that, that depth, the, your, your flexibility limit has been found, but you can stay shallow and do a lot of work on te other techniques and um, efficiency and you know lots of things you can be working on and you can safely train the next day <clears throat> some people uh, teach and, and and say that strong quick movements at depth can cause uh, lung squeeze or, or the tear so that's no fins or pulling on a rope for free immersion. And this may be true to a certain extent. But if the chest is flexible and comfortable at whatever depth, then any movement should be okay. No movement would be uh, you know, dangerous to increase that, that uh, strain between uh, the ribs and the lungs. But if you've reached your flexibility limit, then yeah, any movement's gonna kind of move stuff around, okay? And increase the likelihood of, of damage occurring. So if you've used mouthfill to go deep, to go beyond your flexibility range, then any strain, any hard movement is yes, it's definitely gonna increase the damage done. Okay, so that's the physics and the physiology of mouthfill and how, how it's used. Who have I made this video for? Well, I've made it for individuals to give you an idea of what's happening and warn you against using mouthfill. There is one exception. If you can dive to 70 or 80 meters without using mouthfill, you know you've got plenty of flexibility in the chest, then it's safe to use mouthfill to continue going deeper. And you say 70 or 80 meters, why, why this depth? Well, let's have a look. This uh, pepper represents your lungs at the surface, say eight liters. When you dive down to 30 meters, that's a depth increase of 30 meters, the lung volume will go down to this, a quarter 
of the volume. But if you start with your lungs at this size at 70 meters and increase the depth to 100 meters, that's the same, a 30 meter depth increase, the pressure increase will mean your lungs only go down to this, which is three quarters the size, or 0.72. So uh, one liter at 70 meters is 0.72 liters. So you can see the difference is minimal. And even more than that, we're talking about much lower volumes. So the movement required for the, in the chest to go from 70 meters to 100 meters is, is tiny. In fact, going uh, from 70 meters, if your lungs are compressed down to one liter at 70 meters, if you go to 150 meters, it goes down to half a liter, again, the change, the movement's not much. And in fact, when I was Herbert Nietzsche's coach, when he did 214 meters, he used an extended uh, technical version of mouthfill uh, to go beyond 200 meters, 214 meters to be precise. And, but we knew that he had the flexibility. He was doing 100 meter dives without mouthfill. We knew he had the chest flexibility. So we knew it was safe for him to go beyond using mouthfill. This video is also for instructors who are teaching mouthfill. Now, I can understand the attraction of teaching mouthfill. Somebody turns up at your center and says, I dive this depth, looking at their dive computer, I want to dive deeper. And there's a technique there that, you know, can get them deeper, bigger numbers. I can see the attraction, but it's much better as an instructor or a coach to improve them as a free diver, teach them skills, you know, develop their technique that they've already got, as opposed to just increasing the numbers, especially if there's a possibility of them getting injured by using the techniques. But why are instructors teaching it? This comes back to the third person who should be interested in this video, and that's the institutions. They've actually got mouthfill on the curriculum. They're teaching, they're, in, they're telling their instructors that this is a technique that they should be using and teaching. And We've really got to get the physiology taught. And we, I agree with this, but we've also got to teach the dangers of it. In the same way that we teach uh, hyperventilation and how it could possibly be dangerous, we should be teaching mouthfeel and how it can be dangerous, as opposed to insisting people learn and use it. So this is a physiology you're welcome to use this video, uh, spread it, you know, send it, use it, embed it, wear it, whatever you want. If you want um, a high-res copy of it, email me and I can send you a high-res copy of it without, you know, so you don't have to take it off YouTube, but use it in any way you like. I'd like to thank the No Tanks instructors who have helped me put this video together and the branch directors who help disseminate the information and, of course, the members who make it not only possible for us to do all this, but actually worthwhile doing all this. So thanks again to all the No Tanks members and you guys for joining me. Next week, we'll be doing a slightly lighter um, live stream. Um, hopefully you can join me. See you then. Ciao, ciao.